Ding dong. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to interrupt everybody's discussion and uh, get us going for tonight. So tonight we're actually going to have one of our sponsors that has been involved in a lot of the different things that we've done over the years speak for a little while, kind of tell us a little bit about his company, some things that he thinks are pretty cool in this particular space. Um, but we don't tend to talk about our sponsors often enough. So I wanted to take a little bit of time, kind of talk about them. Uh, and then we'll go into a lot of different events that are coming up, the competitions that are going on, and then kind of hash things out together as a group a little bit. We have a smaller group tonight. Might be a good format for us to be able to maybe get a little bit more chummy chum and actually uh, have a chance to talk with each other about our ideas and our thoughts on data science or what on earth this may be or not be. So our sponsors, and I'll, I'll end with Craig's company, but um, our sponsors, we have a couple of sponsors that are community sponsors that sponsor basically everything we do all year round, um, like health equity. We also have yearly sponsors that cover our big conferences and other things that we do. Um, those would include Merit CX that Pat is with. Um, they really try and take care of us from a financial, but also from his time perspective, which is great. Um, we have companies like Skull Candy, we have OC Tanner, Inside Sales, uh, Ampion, Utah Geek Events, um, as well as uh, Think Big Analytics. We have other companies as well that um, express a ton of interest in what we do, that try to be really involved, and they're national companies as well as the local companies. So we have Cloudera and Hortonworks and Matt Barr, and I already mentioned Think Big, but we'll also see help from Basho and from you know just a wide variety of companies that want to be involved in what we're doing here in our community. And oftentimes when they come in here to town, they see kind of the vibrant community that we have and the things that we're trying to work towards. That's all because of you guys. So in a way, everybody, every member of this community is also a sponsor. We appreciate your help. We also appreciate you guys coming out and and being involved in everything we do. So for tonight, before we go into some of the events and everything else, love to introduce uh, Craig Brown, who's from uh, Pico Clusters, one of the companies, one of the different groups that he does. And he'll tell you a little bit about what that is, <clears throat> what a Pico Cluster is, what it does, why it might actually be valuable for you. But also Craig has been involved with the Utah Hadoop Users Group for four years now or so. Um, as well as the Big Data Utah group. He's one of the organizers. He helps us out with a lot of different events. He provided the pizza and the muffins and the water and everything tonight, which we really appreciate. So let's, uh, let's give a round of applause for Craig and his company and everything he does. <laughs> Come over to the mic. Mic over here too. If you don't mind repeating your questions for the people that are on watch online. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Sorry. <laughs> it's probably probably better. Okay. So I, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with this little with this little case here. Um, if you haven't been to, please go to picocluster.com. We have an email list uh, that you can sign up for. Uh, that we, we're kind of keeping everybody uh, up to date as we're going on. So what, what this is here is a, is a case containing some Raspberry Pis, a network switch, and power distribution to be able to make it into what's really a, a tiny data center. So if you consider the, the NSA or Google or Facebook. <laughs> so we're trying to ca calculate how much smaller this is, actually <laughs> physically smaller and computationally smaller. Uh, a ratio, but the whole idea is, you know, I mean, if, if you think about our industry, I mean, one of the biggest issues is there's just there's not enough talent, right? There's not enough talent in IT in general. The companies uh, can't get the people that they want, and when you look at more some of the more specialties like big data, it's even worse. It's almost impossible to find anybody. Uh, if you can, you got to pay them big bucks, which obviously is good for us, right? Um, but uh, you know, otherwise, they've got to try to train their own people. That's obviously expensive as well. You got to get the equipment. You got to have them take the time. All this stuff. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, colleges are trying to really catch up with the trends and what's going on. But the gap between what businesses need and what colleges are able to produce, that gap is getting wider every year. Right? They're not able to 
business is moving faster, the colleges can keep up with it. And what's even more alarming is if you, if you track that back into high schools and middle schools, um, fewer and fewer high school and middle school students are really interested in STEM education, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. And so that's not really a, a good trend you know, for, for us as a country. We need, we need to get students much more involved in STEM, not less involved in STEM. So part of the challenge is going to be trying to figure out you know, what, how we can reverse those trends. And so our idea is um, let's, let's try to figure out a different way of, of doing the training, right? Especially in big data. It's, it's tough. If, and I go because this is where I came from. <laughs> what I wanted to start learning to do, I went on eBay, I bought a bunch of x86 servers, took them home, plugged them in, loaded them up, played for a long time. I'm serious. <laughs> so God, I got pictures, you can look at my blog. Um, and that's how I got started with it. Part of the problem is, though, those servers cost like five or six hundred bucks a month to run. <laughs> so consequently, they're not on right now. They're, they're, waste, they're, they're just sitting there because it's too expensive. So, the idea is, well, how can I replicate that in, in something that's a lot cheaper and a lot more energy efficient? And so that's where something like this comes in, right? So it's not nearly as fast as the x86 boxes, but that's okay. I, I really don't need it to be as fast. I'm, I'm really looking for functionality. And the great thing is that it, it runs all the same software. I can load Apache Dupe on here, and, and uh, it runs perfectly well. As a matter of fact, if, uh, if you... Uh, some of you are actually on the email list. We actually got some of the Raspberry Pi 2s and tested those. And so we're able to do a 10 gigabyte data sort on five Raspberry Pis 2 in a little over 30 minutes. I think that's honestly pretty impressive. You know, I don't know how often you need to sort 10 gigabytes, but you know, it's as, as, as something you could do. With one gigabyte, it could sort in a little over three minutes, three and a half minutes, right? So that's actually real work. That's not just a hobbyist. That's not just fun. That's actually, I can do something incredibly interesting with this thing in this little queue. And even better, it takes like 15 watts of power, right? This thing costs like 20 bucks a year to run, <laughs> not 20 bucks an hour. <laughs> Some of my other ones do. So, um, so we, uh, many of you know, we are planning on doing a Kickstarter project. We were kind of planning on doing that already, but we've decided to push back plans and try to get this organized a little bit better and really figure out the market before we push this out, because we think it has the, the possibility of really doing, being something amazing, but we've got to, it's got to be done right, right? It's got to be done well. We don't want to just push this out. And so uh, we've always talked about having some, uh, a bundle of software that goes with it that makes it easy to use the cluster. So for example, if you want to install Hadoop, Anybody tried installing Hadoop on their own? Yeah. How many days did it take you? <laughs> yeah, I did get there, right? <laughs> I remember the first time I did it, it took me about a week to finally get a, a, a working cluster, you know, working, more than more than one node. And this is pretty common. It's just it's 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 actually not terribly difficult software, but if you're not an operations person, and I'm not really by trade, I'm a software engineer, I can still do it well. It takes time, right? So one of the things we want to do is reduce that to a point and click install. So, or possibly drag and drop, one of those two. <laughs> Might be drag and drop. So what, part of what we want to create is essentially like an app store, but for software that runs on this. So you can go and have a selection software and you want to run it back to do, drag it over, let it do, let it do its work. It comes back up. You've got a working Hadoop cluster. You know, in in a few minutes on your desktop. So that's one of the huge barriers is just even getting the software installed. So we're going to do that for Elasticsearch, for different flavors of um, of Hadoop, Cassandra, Spark, uh, HBase, a bunch of these different software packages. And we want to make it an open community so that other people can create these packages and contribute to the community. So we want to be able to make that grow, right? Um, we also want to introduce some, some desktop-oriented software that will allow you to interact with it easier. So, for example, um, Elasticsearch is actually is a search engine. It's actually quite easy to get up and running, but getting data in and out of it is, is a little bit uh, challenging, right? It's not really, it's not easy to do. <laughs> I mean, it's not a hard function. It's just there's nothing set up to do that. 
So what we want to be able to do is have this so that you can have an interface on the desktop that you can drag and drop data to your, your Hadoop cluster, to your Elasticsearch cluster, any of that kind of stuff, right? Here's my data, let me drag it over, now let me do a search and I'm done. So we're, we're, we're kind of, we're taking those barriers out of it, right? The biggest thing though really is, is I think the key to this whole thing is really about training content, right? We don't want to just give people a box and say, here, you can do some fun things, and yeah, you can install apps. It's like, great, I installed Hadoop. What can I do with it now, right? So we need to have training for this thing. We need to be able to have courses so that uh, people can, you know, not just specifically for this, but we want to generate a lot of content so that when people pick this up, they've got a whole ecosystem that's there for them already. So there's three big areas that we want to target, right? The first is big data. We want to target big data training. The second thing, one of the, the, the big gaps uh, that we're hearing more and more about is women in IT, right? So we want to get women, um, sorry, I lost my, lost the, said women. <laughs> um, we want to get women in IT to develop other training courses that, that can be used to get it out there, right? to be able to help kind of support that part, part of the market. The other part is high school, middle school, and college. We want to start getting, you know, we want to start training the next generation of engineers of, of you know, if you think about it, parallel and distributed computing engineers are in high school right now. We want to start training those guys. And so to do this, what we're going to do, so this is the, this is the first time I'm announcing this, so this is a benefit for coming, <laughs> coming to the show. Oh, by the way, uh, Code Camp on, uh, on Saturday, come out to it. We're going to be there. A lot of other people are going to be there. Um, so what we're going to do as part of the Kickstarter is we're going to set aside at least $25,000 to be used towards, um, towards paying authors to start coming up with content for, for this, right? And I'm not talking about the big fancy guys. I want you guys out there to, to, to come around and start doing this, right? So we want to provide some money up front to, to give some incentive uh, to start producing the content plus uh, royalties that are normal in this kind of a space, right? I've been approached a couple times by a couple of these content companies to produce some stuff for Elasticsearch since I'm good at that. But the whole idea was, you produce all the content, you do all the work, you do all the time, you put everything into it, you give us the, the content, and then we'll give you money for it. I'm like, well, <laughs> honestly, that's just, you know what, that's just not worth, it's not worth my time, right? It's not worth my time to do that. So we want to we want to incentivize people, and we want, you know, we'd love to get well-known authors to come and start producing content, but we want we want everyday, everyday engineers to come up start generating content. It doesn't have to be a big deal. We just want to do 30 minute segments. We figure that that's, I mean, honestly for me, if I see a video and it's an hour or two hours, I'm not that interested. <laughs> I don't have enough bandwidth to spend that much time. If it's 30 minutes, that's a good chunk. I can pay attention. I can go through the exercises. I can do that in 30 minute chunks, right? And you know, the whole course may be eight hours, but we want to divide up in 30 minute chunks. It's also a lot easier to produce if you're an author, if it's only 30 minutes, right? You can get through that a lot easier than trying to do a two or three hour, you know, thing. So uh, we also want to get, we want to get teenagers to start producing content for other teenagers, right? We're, we're not, we want to, we're trying to figure out exactly how we can make that happen. But if you've got sons and daughters that are interested in IT, it doesn't have to be big data. It doesn't have to be the Pico cluster. We want to talk to them and see if we can, uh, get them to, to start, you know, getting getting comfortable and producing content that other teenagers are going to, you know, they, they don't want to, teenagers I don't think want to see me on a video trying to explain this stuff. <laughs> I may be very good at it, but I may not be, you know, I may not be interested to them at all. But if it's another teenager, someone in their age group, I think they're going to be a lot more likely to be able to do that. And so as part of that, that the kids that are producing content, we're going to give them a lifetime subscription to the content on the site. Plus, we're going to see if we can do some kind of scholarships or different things, uh, either privately or through colleges like the University of Utah for these students that are able to produce content. Something that's that's extremely valuable for these guys, right? So, spread the word. Twenty-five grand at least that we're going to set aside 
And that's just for producing content. That's just the upfront money that we want to pay to start producing content. There'll be royalties down the road after that. So um, we're going to explain more on Saturday. So I'll be speaking at 9 a.m. Saturday morning. So I'd love to see you guys all there. We're going to have a table. We're going to have some demos running and stuff like that. We'll have the new Raspberry Pi, Pi 2s running. <laughs> so you just see how those work. So anyway, thanks, guys. Sorry, questions? Do you have any offers yet? No. Me first. Yep, you want yeah, you want to sign up? <laughs> oh, okay, great. Great. I've I've done a few things. We're we're also planning on setting up a small studio that we can use as well. So and, and to provide some support as well if this is, you know, if doing training videos is kind of a new thing. Um, we don't want that to be a barrier or an impediment. You know, if you haven't done it, that's great. Come talk to us if you're good at something. Let's figure out how we can get some content up there and, and working. Uh, we figure, you know, we should be able to get at least 100 hours of training. I did the math right. You know, it, at least to get started with. Uh, we want to start producing content this summer and have something available this fall. Uh, if we can get 100 hours of content out there, I think that'll be a pretty good selection for everybody. And then just kind of grow up from there. So we're planning on doing a Kickstarter project probably, probably in May. So you have one, one project for your people cluster, but then this will be like a different project for the the training, or is it all like one single project? Uh, yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> they're they're related. They'll probably be. We'll probably set them up as separate but related companies for different purposes. So yeah. So that's it. That's at least if we blow out the Kickstarter and can raise more money, then we're going to put more money towards training. Anybody else? Well, we'll be there Saturday. If you guys can come Saturday, you can spend all day talking to us. So, thanks. Thanks a lot, Craig. <clears throat> so we have a bunch of other events that are coming up just around the corner, um, but one of the first ones that I wanted to have us talk about, even though chronologically it doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't follow that path, would be Barton Polson, who's here tonight, um, talking about the data dive at the end of the month. And Barton, I'll let you give the details and everything else. Hi, I'm Bart Paulson. I'm actually a psychology professor at Utah Valley University where I uh, teach statistics all day long. But I um, uh, received a grant from my university recently to organize a two-day data dive that will be happening the end of this month on Friday, March 27th and Saturday, March 28th. And what we're going to be doing is if you've been to a hackathon, it's the same idea. Basically, take a bunch of people, lock them in a room for 48 hours, and see what they're able to do this productive. We're getting data from at least a couple of local nonprofit organizations who are in need of assistance. One is the Utah County Crisis Line, and another one is the Springville Museum of Art, which has an extensive outreach program. And in both cases, they are relying on uh, spreadsheets and one of them is literally doing paper and pencil tabulations for their grant reports and um, so basically I figure this is this is by any means this is small data it fits on an Excel spreadsheet but there's a huge amount that can be done that would be useful both in terms of serving you know obviously through the crisis line we're talking about potential life and death situations because it is linked up to a it is a suicide hotline as well but the Springfield Museum of Art because of the services they provide being the major provider in Utah County and simply taking um, call logs about when calls come and some very basic information about them and taking attendance records and then trying to make it so that that information is readily accessible and clean and they don't have to get out a pencil and a paper anymore to uh, put stuff together but also the opportunity to link it up with a large number of data sets that we can access on our own about events going on in the um, in the county and the state 
that can be used by the organizations to help predict when they would have greater demand or need or they could be more effective in their services. So it's a wonderful opportunity. Again, it's gonna be at UVU in Orem. You can take the train down there. I took the front runner. And um, I'm inviting anybody but anybody. My students, I'm giving them their first ever statistics course in their lives. And they are coming because they know what a mean is. And they're gonna be there also to simply help organize the event. And we're looking for anybody with any kind of interest or expertise from uh, the ability to get data out of a spreadsheet and into something more useful to creating visualizations to hopefully linking up some APIs to getting just a finished analysis for the people and giving them some solid recommendations. Again, uh, anybody with expertise in business uh, who knows how to reach a market, that insight is, is absolutely welcome. So I'm inviting you guys. I got a ton of flyers here, way more than there are of you. And, um, you know, can I bring something up on this computer? Okay. Just a new browser. Okay, Mr. Many Tabs. Oh, okay. stop. <laughs> Everybody's picking out my tabs. Yeah, 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 yeah. I gotta now let's move it over to the Oh, do you need to click something? No, nope, no, just scroll it up. Uh, I just need to get it on the screen. Yeah, it's so we're at utahdatadive.org, and look, we got a logo. Uh, isn't that beautiful? And um, if you register really soon, you can get free food for two days and a t-shirt and possibly some other little swag. Um, it turns out people are signing up for this at a much faster rate than I anticipated. So my grant money is now all accounted for, and I'm now trying to find other money to get more food, um, which is I've never had um, this embarrassment of riches of talent and interest before. But I invite you guys and anybody else that you know who might be interested in who can come down to Orem, ideally both days, even if it's just for a few hours on one day, anything would be appreciated. I've got some flyers. I'll leave them up here on this table. Um, do you have any questions about this? Can we set up a remote session up here? You know, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, I, um, I, I also rent out some office space in downtown at a place called Impact Hub. They are very interested in doing something like this at their place, and they get they move into their new space next week. It's going to be swanky. It's going to be large, and I absolutely plan on repeating this very soon. I'm I'm mostly saying, trying to see how long it takes me to crash and burn on this particular event, and um, <laughs> but uh, we're going to reorg. <laughs> get out the stopwatch. <laughs> we will be recreating it in Salt Lake County um, as soon as possible. Um, Strike that for the record. Yeah, yeah. Just go to this one, and then we'll talk about. Yeah, we'll talk about. <laughs> yeah, um, because this also serves as sort of a, a test case. I like to think of this as the the newbie version of what these guys organize for people who cannot commit to something for more than forty hours. <laughs> so it's, it's the very, very time and space limited. You come in, you hit it, you're done, you go. Um, and then hopefully it will also serve as an excellent example, thinking of what Craig said about motivating STEM students. That's not what my students do. Most of my students are planning on becoming social workers, which is a fabulous thing to do. But I've had a handful who, after they see what's possible, have actually decided to try to pursue some sort of career that blends their interest in social and behavioral sciences along with an interest in data, which is what I do. And so I think it's a fabulous opportunity. Anyhow, I'll leave these out here for you guys. Thank you very much. Do you want to talk about Code Camp and what's coming up? Yeah, help me close that tab. Is it right? No, this one. Yeah, no, I just want to close it. Oh, what? what did I just close? There. So, yeah, you're, you're back on this one. Okay. Code Camp. Uh, Code Camp is coming up this Saturday, very, 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 very soon from now. Um, yeah, open the next one. So that, yeah, go ahead. Um, where did it go? There. Mm -hmm. um, so Code Camp's coming up next Saturday. I mean, this Saturday. Uh, we have, I want to say, 73 sessions, something like that, 65 sessions. It's a bunch. It's a lot of sessions. They're up on the screen. You can barely read them because this projector really stinks. But all you got to do is go to utahgeekevents.com uh, slash 
uh, schedule and you'll find it or just click on schedule up at the top. It's not that hard to find. Please register. Um, you go to the main page, you say log in, I mean register, and you, then you say you're attending the event. Uh, we do that because we're providing lunch, we're providing giveaways, we're providing all sorts of fun stuff, breakfast for the first X amount of people. Meaning if you want breakfast or coffee, get there early. If you don't, please don't complain later on in the day when you didn't get coffee. If you roll in at 10 o'clock and there's no coffee, I'm gonna have no mercy for I'm sorry, it's just not gonna happen. Um, but I would invite you to come early, get some coffee, get some uh, bagels and stuff that we put out. But there is a ton of great sessions in here. There are wonderful big data sessions in the afternoon as well. There's some in the morning. There's a lot of different data sessions, a lot of different technologies. I mean, basically, if you work in different technologies, the Code Camp is the best place for you because we do not have one track dedicated to one thing. We have everything. We have every different variation you could think of, from .NET to Java to Python to data analytics to SQL to NoSQL, everything's in there. So, and in the afternoon, um, I don't know if I can even see my bar properly, but over here, we'll have a couple of sessions that are called the unconference sessions. Basically, this just leaves a room open and you're welcome to go into that room and discuss with the other people that are in the room, whatever the topic is for the unconference. There's no presenter. It's just open to talk about whatever topics you want to talk about. We've had a few submitted already. I think NoSQL versus relational. There was another one submitted. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there was a couple topics. They will be posted on the room, but again, it's an open room for you to use for whatever you want to talk about. So it's open and, and everybody can use it. But yeah, uh, PlayStation 4 to give away during the day. Um, we'll have some other giveaways, a bunch of good things. We'll be announcing competitions and stuff. So definitely, really great place to go. If you want to network or talk to other people, we'll have over 600 people there in the community. So, I mean, if you're looking for work, if you are working, if you're trying to hire, things like that, that's the best place to be because they're all right there. So, but definitely come out. Uh, it starts at nine o'clock Saturday morning, um, goes to about five. Uh, parking's okay. It's at the university. It's all free. So, <laughs> do get there early. They killed one of lots and they're building a garage above it so yeah but there's plenty of parking and stuff questions no nope, no phone what, what building is it in? uh spencer fox eccles business building what what the, the building? yes the whale on stilts okay <laughs> uh, hey i can't say enough good things about that building <laughs> That is one of the nicest conference centers that I have to use, and I use it for as many things as I can. Is there a fee to attend? No, it's absolutely free. Who pays for this? Uh, a lot of sponsors. <laughs> yeah, Craig. Craig is one of our wonderful, excellent sponsors. Um, if you go to the sponsors page, I don't even want to try to click because it'll maybe, let's see, can I see the word yeah. sponsors right there? There you go. Here's our primary sponsors. We still have a few more getting added in. But like I said, you can see some of the different companies that are out there. Um, they sponsor and they take care of us. So, but yeah, it'll all be taken care of through sponsors. And Utah Geek Events puts it all on. It's a 501c3 not for profit. So everything we do is volunteer. Everything we do is basically free. And do you have, there are some events that will be suitable for my kids? There are definitely, well, there was some kids sessions that got dropped. There was a few, um, but I definitely think that there's some sessions. If you've got teenagers, we love to have teenagers there usually. I mean, we always tell people it's up to you. If you have an eight-year-old that's been programming in Python or something, bring them to the code camp. That's absolutely accessible, acceptable. If they're trying to get immediately started, wait for one of our kids' fair events. You know, or the Open West guys also have a great programming track for kids. That's the perfect spot for them. Because if they can't be attentive for basically an hour long session, I would be careful about that. So, but we, we absolutely welcome them. We've had kids win prizes <laughs> every, every year. One person won a Visual Studio license one year and I'm like, okay, in two years you have to come present to Code Camp because you, you won the software and you're gonna learn how to code. So come and present now for us. <laughs> so he hasn't presented yet, but I'm still on him about it. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right, what other events do we want to mention though too while we're on events? Well, and so on that one real quick, one, I wanted to mention that if it's less than an hour on the tentative piece, I may not actually be able to show up on Saturday. 
What? No, never <laughs> no, they're great. They're absolutely fantastic <laughs> sessions. Um, I don't want to try and find that schedules tab, but <laughs> on that schedule tab, you'll see like Bryce Wright from Think Big or Bryce, Bryce Cottom. Bryce Cottom. Sorry, too many uh, Bryces in the world. Yeah. Anyway, uh, from Think Big Analytics, he's an amazing speaker. There's also three on there. Um, that go all in the same room that are basically a data science track, track. is kind of what they're putting the air quotes around it as well, right? Yeah. Um, and that's going to be Mitchell Harrison, Ben Taylor, and Jed Ludlow. Yeah. So probably many of you are speaking there. We'll have Craig, we'll have you know, Dave, you're going to be speaking? Oh, no, oh, okay. not <laughs> um, Anyway, a whole bunch of people will be out there speaking. So please attend. Good luck trying to pick which session you're going to go to because there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of good ones. So other events. So next week we have the Utah Hadoop Users Group meeting, and we'll have Andy Lawrence presenting on data management. So he's taking a look at all of the different um, distributed systems, all the different systems within this space, and he started seeing some general problems with them. And so his company narrows down a really cool approach to that. So come out to that. It'd be a good space for you to, to learn a little bit more. On Thursday, we'll have the Hadoop lunch at Adobe. I need to get that up on the meetup still. Sorry about that. It's uh, hard to keep up with them sometimes. And then we do have the data dive coming up as well, like we mentioned. And then in April, on the 17th and 18th, on the 18th in particular, we will have the Big Mountain Data Spring Conference. Right? That is one of the two big events that we do that are big data specific throughout the year or are data specific throughout the year, right? Um, the one in the fall is very much about all things data. This one is very targeted towards big data and we actually invite the speakers kind of one at a time, one at a time and try to determine what's going to be the most beneficial for everybody here. Last year we did it up at Goldman Sachs and we had a couple hundred people there and we went from a very introduction or introductory level discussion of what big data is, how it applies to you, to more advanced subjects throughout the day to where by the end, you're actually learning some fairly ex expert level subjects. And then we repeated that again in the afternoon, right? Um, <clears throat> this year, we kind of hope that you've heard of big data. <laughs> then maybe you don't need as much of the introduction level. Now, many of us though do need some sort of introduction or how do I get started? Like, I know what this is, I've heard of it, I understand that there's, different parts like analytics or processing. But now, what does that mean? How do I actually do that? How do I make that valuable for my company, for my career, for me as an individual? And so we'll go into some pragmatic steps throughout the day that can kind of help you get into the process, almost workshop uh, style processes as well. On the day before, there will be an executive track as well. So if you are at an executive level, CIO, CTO, or if you want to invite your CIO, CTO, get them out there. It'll make you look good for having them there too, right? And hopefully if you're there, uh, it'll be really beneficial for you as well. Okay. Uh, we'll get more details up about that very soon. We want to kind of get through this weekend and then start getting all of that up and available and out to everybody. Uh, we'll mention the keynote speakers and all of that information as well. Okay. The other event coming up too is Open West. Open West is May 6th through the 9th. Correct me if I'm wrong. So 6th is tutorials. Right. So 7th, 8th, and 9th. Yep. Uh, UVU. That's a UVU as well. Um, openwest.org. Great, great event. I attended last year. It was wonderful. I'm speaking this year, so please come out and see me speak. But there's, there's such great sessions there as well. Um, all on open source topics. And they'll have 1,500 people over those three and four days. So it's a really, really great thing. Go out and see it, openwest.org. Did you want to add? Well, there is a, there is a data track. I think uh -huh. it's two days or all three days. It's like one room dedicated all. It's at least two because I'm inside it. Yeah. yeah, I've seen at least, the at least I think the Friday, Saturday is, is the full thing. Yeah, I forget it's on Thursday. Yeah. Either way, go check out the schedule. They released it just recently. It's it's really good. It's got a lot of great sessions. So go check it out, openwest.org. Um, great event coming up. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so competitions. One, did anybody have any questions about events or other things coming up? Or other events that are around? Yeah, if you can Which one do you want? Let me grab this one. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, we're you good. Make it big? Uh, yeah. Um, right. Right. So, that sounds expensive, or no? It'll be free as well. Oh, cool. The spring events and the fall events are always free. 
Um, so we'll again get sponsors for that and we'll get some of those things put together. Some of the people we mentioned here are already helping us sponsor those events as well. So, but it will be absolutely free for the big number of events. Okay. All right, so other other questions, events, or other things coming up? Okay, so we have several competitions that are going on. We've got a couple that are going on right now, and then we'll have some additional ones coming down the pipeline. So we're going to go into some of the details of those tonight, and then we'll bring up other pieces as well. We'll I'm going to wait on the Taylor Swift competition until last, since that's the one that's going on right this second. Um, and then we kind of have to wrap up. And so I want to be able to give people a chance to really kind of ask questions, figure out where things are at, kind of work together maybe a little bit to see if we can beat some of the leaders on the scoreboard there. <laughs> but we also right now have the OC Tanner competition going on as well. So OC Tanner has provided data sets for us um, so that we can look at appreciation analytics. So basically we can understand what companies are doing with inside an organization to appreciate their, their employees. And when they do that appreciation in whatever form it is, if that has a ripple effect that causes others to appreciate somebody else within that same organization, okay? Now there are bonus points if you can find a way to also show how that then benefits something within inside the organization, such as productivity or performance, et cetera, et cetera, right? <clears throat> um, so, or, or other things as well, such as uh, retention rates and. I mean, there's a lot of different applications to this as well, right? So this competition on the 16th, which is this upcoming Monday, we're going to have OC Tanner, um, actually Jake Bingham there, who helped provide the data sets, sort through a lot of the information and everything else for us. He's going to present at OC Tanner. Make sure to bring your driver's license. <laughs> you have to be able to use that to, <clears throat> that to get through security. There's a reason why you put water up at the front of these things. Um, so Jake will go through a lot of the terminology. There's certain things inside the data sets that I've got certain questions out there that you can get very specific answers to. Make sure that you try to bring your team if possible. It'll be a good time for you to be able to kind of hash out some ideas and think through what questions you need to get answered before we actually get into the competition or before we wrap up the competition. <clears throat> all data sets, all of your information, everything needs to be presented by April 10th. Um, which is the week before the conference. That will give us a little bit of time to review some of those data sets, review your results, your solutions, and then be able to call in, potentially if necessary, some people to kind of present on their solutions or to tell us a little bit about what they've done and why they did that in particular. When we did the air quality competition, for those of you who were involved in that, um, it ended up being a lot about the presentation at the end. And it was very focused and you really wanted to do a great job with the presentation. We do still want that, but the focus isn't on that. The focus is on what is the solution? What can you do to provide value to OC Tanner and maybe to other companies that can benefit from this type of thing, right? And so <clears throat> although there will be a little bit of time to create uh, a presentation, it's not going to be a ton of time. Definitely make your focus on the work itself, how it goes, everything else, okay? Um, I'm not going to flip through all the different slides and everything on this tonight unless people want me to, but let's go through some questions. Yeah. Um, if you find that there is no ripple effect, can you still win? Yeah, absolutely. So you could actually show <laughs> there is no, yeah, so so the question was, um, if you find that there is not a, rep, a ripple effect at all, could you still win? And the answer is yes. If you can if you can prove that that's the case, but you can also show that hey, maybe they shouldn't be looking for a ripple ripple effect. That's still incredibly valuable to the company, right? Um, but it's all in how you how that information is presented, right? If you go into a company that's searching for gold and you tell them there's no gold, they may not be happy with that, or they may like the fact that now they can go search in a different area. Does that make sense? And so when you go in and you do that kind of presentation or you say, look, there is a ripple effect, but instead you may want to focus on this area where the mine is much better, <laughs> much more valuable. Does that make sense? Okay. Marissa? Um, I'm to think a little bit about how you wanted to do the work that were presented even before the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, how do we want the presentations to look at the end? How do you want them wrapped up? 
whether it's in scripts or maybe it's show your code, maybe it's an executive summary, things along those lines, right? For sure, we will want an executive summary. And then in addition to that, you will need to be able to present your code. So at least have that available. Um, and it would be ideal if you had some CSV or you have, you have some basic formats that are fairly easy for OC Tender to be able to open and everything else, right? We'll probably have, you know, CIO, maybe even some other executives, VPs, um, product managers, different types of people within the organization will re be reviewing your results and the data and everything else. Just like you would have <clears throat> in any other organization, whether it's in education or in business or any other space. Right? So you want to keep your audience in mind as much as possible. And I'll try to keep defining that as time goes on too. Okay. Other questions? Thoughts? Okay. So again, please try to build your teams. We do have people that are competing as individuals for this. We do have teams that are fairly large. Um, if you don't mind me asking, Marissa, how, how big is your team now at this point? Five or so, yeah. So I think probably the largest team is going to be somewhere between that five and ten type range. Um, but I don't think that's necess necessarily going to be a huge advantage or disadvantage based on size, right? And there are no, there isn't a set restriction that you can't have 500 people if you want it that might be cumbersome and <laughs> not very beneficial. So that's exactly what you're doing, project management. <laughs> yeah. Um, questions, thoughts, anything else? How's it coming so far? Have, have a couple of people been able to get in and kind of find some interesting things or at least move through a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So the comment was that there's still there's a lot of sparse sparsity to the data. There's a lot of things missing, you know, NAs and um, you know other things that return that aren't exactly there. So okay, okay, excellent. So I'm going to move on to this global competition that I talk about all the time. And Pat, it might be good for you to help me drive here a little bit. Is it this one up here? Right. Yeah, that yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, what do I want? Okay. Yeah. And of course, that button. Can I hit enter? No. Allow, and then yeah, I'll it'll move. The arrows and then yeah, it'll move. Okay. Yeah. okay. So the global data competition. So I've been kind of hinting at this for a while. <clears throat> We're starting to narrow down the details. And when I say we, that's uh, I'm actually working together with the Boulder Group out in Colorado to help create this, as well as MapR and a whole bunch of other groups that are trying to help us kind of define the details and work out how this is going to work and how we're going to get it spread out to everybody, right? So this is actually going to be incredibly exciting, and I really want the whole community to get behind this. And there's a way that we can actually all work together, as well as as individuals and teams. And I'll go into some of that here in a little bit as well. This is not an official presentation on this tonight. Although we're really close on details, um, Colorado has actually already announced this to their group, so I thought, hey, we can't be behind. Um, so I'm going to give some of the details here, kind of ask your thoughts, questions. If people want to help out with this, let me know as well, and we'll try to work through some of the details together. Um, but uh, yeah, they're going to announce it again in their group this week too, so let's not fall too far behind. It. <laughs> so the global data competition. So Utah has had a goal for quite some time now to become the, the big data leader for the entire world, right? And we've thought of all sorts of different ways to do this. I've talked about this in many different meetups in the past, but we could try to become like Silicon Valley where we're creating all of the tools, the technologies, where we're trying to lead uh, from more of a creation and, and an ideation type space and try to be all the startups and everything else, right? Um, I think it would take us a long time to catch up there. We could try to have more data scientists per capita than anywhere else in the world. And I think we're actually doing pretty well there. We have some really great universities here. We heard from Bart earlier about UVU. They've got some classes. We've got great classes at BYU, at Utah State, at the University of Utah. We even have classes at Slick and, and Weber State at this point. We've got um, uh, we also have some of the smaller colleges like Westminster and others that really stand out, even on a global scale, for data science. 
but I still don't know if we're going to compare to MIT and to Stanford and some of the other areas that have Ivy League schools that are kind of powerhouses. Right? Um, so what other ways are people leaders? Sometimes being a leader is not so much about what you know, I'm kind of living proof of that, <laughs> but rather about finding a way to help motivate others and to help teach others and help people come along and achieve something great. So as a community and as a state, we have an opportunity to lead the entire world in exactly that gap, that shortage of engineers that Craig was talking about earlier. We have a chance to find a way to help people around the world get excited about STEM, about science and technology and engineering and math. You know, when most of us were kids or even before some of us were kids, you didn't have to talk about science and technology and whether or not it was something that was interesting because you had the space program and you had things going on that were absolutely fascinating and incredible. And now we see technology coming at us at such a rapid rate that sometimes it goes completely over our heads. And we use these phones that are an absolute marvel and we never think twice about what it is that they're doing day in, day out. You know, my phone probably has more processing power than any <laughs> rocket ship that made it to the moon for <laughs> however long or was able to exit orbit. Yet we don't think about that on a regular basis, right? Um, we also don't have a ton of collaboration worldwide. We have open source projects and we have really cool things that happen on a global basis, but how often do universities get together with uh, you know, the rest of the business world? How often does the government side of the world work together to try to accomplish something great? You know, I hear about things like um, you know, the G20 summit or you know, big economic summits or big climate change summit, summits or other things out there. And I kind of think, why aren't you asking more people than these 12 politicians who may or may not even care about this particular subject, right? There are problems in the world that every one of us face on a day-to-day -day basis. It's kind of hard to create something that's ubiquitous, that affects everyone. To really think about something that regardless of your culture, regardless of your geography, regardless of uh, your income level, your uh, your race, your gender, or anything else, it affects you. But there are things out there like that, and I think if we as a state can find a way to take this data science world and apply it to one of these huge problems that everybody cares about, and that everybody has something very specific to them about, and then find a way to have us all compete together and find ways for us to be motivated so that each one of us wants to be involved in some way, we can create something great. You know, the power of a Hadoop cluster or any form of massively parallel processing comes, and I've mentioned this actually, I think last meetup, but comes when you get the compute power of one or two small commodity-based hardware servers, and you start adding that up with a bunch of other servers in the cluster. That's where it becomes powerful. And I think the same thing happens with human beings. You know, when we talk about the data dive, it, you know, if Bart had like five people there, yeah, they'd probably accomplish something. But now that he's looking at dozens, you know, four or five dozen people showing up, they may be able to accomplish some amazing things that, that, that those companies would never be able to afford. In fact, I almost, I'm not going to say I guarantee it because it's your, your thing, but I think it's very, very likely that you will accomplish something really incredible for those guys on those couple of days, 40 hours, and it's going to be tons of work. So what can we do for a global data competition that will affect everybody, that everybody's going to care about worldwide? Again, kind of a complicated problem. I don't want to, I'm not going to flip through all these little things, really, they're just pretty looking pictures or maybe not that pretty, I don't know. Um, but wanted to go into some of the specifics of the competition itself. So we are going to take on climate change. We did air quality here in Utah last year. And when we did air quality, we chose to not do climate change or, or you know, <laughs> global warming or things along those lines because they're very politicized, right? Especially global warming. 
But climate change is something that you can actually start taking out and making it very specific to each individual. And rather than caring about whether or not the world is as a whole heating up one or two degrees, and maybe that is what you care about, maybe instead we should be caring about our air here in Utah and how it's affecting our quality of life. I mean, how much did those who participated last year learn about air quality? I know so many things about air quality <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I don't even know what to do with it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so many facts and they're they're incredibly valuable things like you know three out of the top 10 or 11 reasons why humans die are related to air quality three out of the top 11 places in the United States that are worst the worst air quality in the year this comes from Marissa and her team are here in Utah three of the worst and we're consistently there um, there are so many different things about that particular piece that are relevant to me. But maybe somebody else really cares about soil quality or water quality. Maybe in your particular country you're worried about population or population growth or you're worried about even a decreasing population. Climate change, our climate, our environment is obviously something that's all around us. It's kind of a definition. <laughs> but it's something that does affect every single person day in, day out. Um, questions about that before I move on to how it'll actually function? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's controversial enough that Google Hangouts should be turned off for a second. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Marissa, do you mind if I mention a couple things real quick? So, so we actually had a, a few different teams that had quite a few different findings. In the long run, we kind of narrowed things down on air quality to say uh, there were 450 data sets or so. You could actually use a variety of others from CDC and other places as well. Um, but we had to narrow it down to focus on economic impacts, health impacts, or quality of life impacts, and how, and or all of the above, and how it affects you as an individual, or it affects the state, or whatever else, right? Um, some of the teams were able to do things like, you know, gather a ton of these data sets and add a lot of data sets into a big community data portal. In fact, we have one on tied to the Big Data Utah site. Um, that also houses all of the teams, uh, what they did and everything else, right? Um, and then rather than taking all my, I'll jump straight to the winner. Sorry for everybody else because there really were amazing things. Um, but the winner of the competition was actually able to show that and make sure I say it correctly. <laughs> the amount of uh, particulate matter in the air on a particular given day, because there may be a lag period, is not directly correlated with the amount of vehicle traffic on that day as well. So in other words, vehicle miles traveled. So on any given day throughout the winter time in Utah, in the Salt Lake Valley alone, we have over 30 million miles vehicle miles traveled on any given day. And so if our focus is on moving people to uh, carpooling, that may not make that much of a difference. Rather, if we can affect the overall fleet and other things, that would be more beneficial. And additionally, we were able to discover, they were able to discover, that it is actually a lot of secondary chemical reactions that happen in the air, rather than the vehicle emissions, the direct emissions themselves. So once those emissions go up into the air, then they start going in with other things that are already in the air or that are in the air from other sources, ammonia nitrates, so on and so forth. All these particular matter things come together in addition to humidity and other factors that we have here in Utah because of our bowls, et cetera. And it makes this big boiling pot that uh, causes all of that air to poof up in the air quickly. So not directly from the competitors, I don't believe, but um, the DEQ and DAQ mentioned that uh, if we look at air quality in Utah from 1950 until now, the air quality is actually significantly better now than it was then. And a lot of that is because of leaded gas and other things that existed 50, 60, 70 years ago and doesn't really exist today. Part of the reason this got controversial is that somebody at the Herald Valley Journal changed it to say cars don't pollute and that's not what <laughs> that's not what was said <laughs> at all in any way shape or form. Yeah. 
that air data, if you don't drive, that's not going to make a huge impact. But if you reduce your travel overall, long term, that's going to make a huge So the zombie apocalypse will help. Did I say that out loud? This is why we get into controversial things. I'm sorry. This is not our next opposition. Nice. Oh, you're good. Oh, yeah. yeah. In your missions. Yeah. yeah, in fact, a lot of that data is available on EPA's websites. They have EPA Air Now, I believe it's called. Um, and so you can look at those different data sets and see how they vary from state to state, from valley to valley, county to county. The hard part, though, is that a lot of the data um, is representative of the amount of sensors that are in that particular area. And so like in Salt Lake Valley, we only have a couple of sensors. Um, we just added one over the winter time, by the way, that follows around on a tracks train, which is hopefully going to be incredible because it will show different areas of the valley and how that pollution affects things, right? Um, but when we, when we look at those different areas, there are things that play in, such as the snow cover here on the valley floor that have a much bigger effect than you would see something maybe in Southern California or other areas. You know, for Bakersfield, part of the reason it gets so smoggy isn't that there is so much overpopulation there, but because the wind passes that air into Bakersfield and then is trapped in, into their valley as well, right? So geography plays a lot into it. I mean, there, there are so many different factors outside of just weather and pollution. Does that kind of help? And did I cross any lines that <laughs> shouldn't be? Okay. Okay. So um, the competition itself, and let me see if I can find this button, button, button. Oh, that's uh, Taylor Swift. That's the data dive. Taylor Swift. Okay. So don't pay too much attention to the man behind the curtain and all the other little things, but right along this line, you'll see different ideas of areas that might be valuable for people to look at. Each community, each individual, each region of the, of the world, as well as area of the world, and then globally, will be able to approach these areas based off of what they care about. Rather than having to judge uh, international competition and have potentially thousands of submissions or whatever else, we will have each region actually judge their own competitions. And then once those regions have chosen winners, they will pass those up, and those will go up to an area competition, and then the area competition will go on to a global competition. We will put this in a grading scale so that people can use this, similar to the Harkness rating scale from chess. Um, so you'll have a grandmaster, you'll have a senior master, you'll have a master. We're not going to go into like class A, B, C, all those. Instead, uh, it'll be something more like, um, you know, might not even be beginner, but maybe like participant, intermediate, advanced, expert, so on and so forth, right? Um, but once you have the scoring for each of those particular areas, so let's say you in particular do really well on three different areas. You'd get 300 points for that area. That would put you maybe just into that uh, intermediate level. Right? be participant up to, into that and then so on right so all of that will be broken out very specifically as we as we move forward but it will allow you to be able to put this up on LinkedIn on your social media presences you'll be able to actually say this is how I ranked compared to other people in my region and other people in my area or globally as well and I'd love to see a, a grandmaster from Utah that <laughs> takes the whole thing but anyway it'll be a complicated thing to do We'll provide data sets, but a lot of it will actually be gathering data sets as well. It'll be finding ways to influence your own data because a lot of the data sets that we're gonna have are gonna be specific to the United States, right? And although I'd love to do it, I think it'd be a really cool, fun project. I'm definitely not going to learn 170 different languages and go around the world trying to gather data sets from every single country out there and region because they're all gonna have different things that they care about, right? Right now, we have New Zealand, Finland, um, India. Uh, we're working with Swahili, um, or not Swahili, with uh, Zimbabwe. Um, we'll probably want to work with South Africa if, if anybody has connections there. Um, if you have connections around the world, please let us know. MapR has 100 different users groups that they're going to reach out to. 
and they're going to ask those users groups to spread out to the other groups in their particular areas. Here in Utah, we'll try to spread out through Utah Geek events and other things as well. Colorado will be working to spread out. We'll have judges in different regions around the world, and those judges will also be helping to spread the word. We will also have um, Ben Taylor and Alton Alexander have talked about creating bots that will go out on LinkedIn and other places and just automatically uh, let everybody know and kind of spread this out to all the LinkedIn groups that relate to big data and data science and to all the others. If people want to help us spread the word, please let us know. We'd like as much help as we can possibly get. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that um, organizations and others can compete. So we'll actually have a category for organizations, for academia, for uh, governments, for others, all to compete together, and communities. And I'd love to see our community, where we've already done some cool things together, have a community group as well. So start thinking about that and deciding if you like us all enough, well enough, that we could all <laughs> get together and work on something. I promise we won't do weekly or bi-weekly meetings like we did <laughs> over the summer for the air quality competition. Um, but I don't know how much we'll actually end up doing as time goes on. Okay. So the um, uh, all of the other information about like what the rankings are, how it works, everything else, we'll hopefully have out and released by the 31st of March. But we may not actually start the competition itself for a little while. There'll probably be a little bit of lag time. So keep looking for information over the next couple of weeks. Please let me know if you have additional thoughts and ideas on how this can be done, what the focuses should be, what you feel would be important. Our region is going to need to decide a lot of those things as well as our area and globally as well. And because Utah and Colorado are heading that up, will be the places that decide the global side. Right? And so I need you guys to help us make sure those are wise decisions <laughs> and kind of hash it through with us. And feel free to say the meanest things you can come up with because I've got thick skin and I'll be fine. <laughs> I work with Pat, so I see what he does to his boss. And <laughs> I know that I have to be tough. So questions about the global competition, what's going on, what we're going to do? So March 31st will be the official announcement, um, whether I'll do it on that date. Like, we'll have everything done by that date. We might have to create a special meeting for it or just do something on the meetups or whatever else. I don't know. So. Other questions? Question for you guys. What's going to motivate you to, to work on this and to compete on it day in, day out? Okay. I'm just saying whatever saying. That's good. Money? What else? I <laughs> That's true. Money is far more motivating, I think. I, I would have said something that, that makes a difference. I, I would hear that from managers all the time. I want to go work on something where I feel like it makes a difference somewhere or somewhere. Yeah. So I actually think for the regions and everything else, like if they're not making a difference, it's not going to be valuable in this case, right? If we're taking on something like climate change, you can't just say, oh, and this is, the weather's going to be prettier in Hawaii on uh, the seventh, you know, whatever, right? Uh, along those lines, though, I did, I did, well, I guess maybe it's not exactly on those lines, but uh, we are going to focus on correlations rather than causation. Um, it's a very complicated thing to look at full causation, especially when we talk about a global or regional scale. Uh, you start adding in chaos theory, and you're, it's never going to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, so on the money side, and there might be other things. You know, I think that having cool titles that actually mean something on a global scale will be valuable, will be something that will kind of motivate you. I think being able to make a difference will, will motivate people. Working with others, learning something, I think finding ways to just collaborate with other communities around the world and around the country would be really valuable as well. If you guys want, I can try and set up meetings with other places. We're going to have an Intermountain Big Data Conference hopefully in the fall, and so we'll already be working with other places in this region, um, you know, things like that. From a money perspective, if we tried to do something that was more crowdsourcing, where we tried to crowdsource the money, is that something that people would be interested in? 
I'm a little bit concerned about getting money from sponsors because then a sponsor may feel like they own the results or that they should get some really big value out of the money that they've provided. Everybody here give a dollar? Can I get two? Oh wait, <laughs> that's not my that's not my job. <laughs> my one of the things that I'd like to see. I don't know if we can do it, but many of the big data competitions that are out there uh, have raised a million dollars over the years. So you've got like the Netflix prize, you've got some of these other prizes. If we did something that large, we'd split it up. We wouldn't have one grand prize of that big. Um, but if we did. I'd want it to be fun and cool. So, yeah. Anyway, we'd set some high goals and find a way to make something happen. Okay. Other questions, thoughts? Pat, are you still terrified? Yeah, I think challenge is definitely one. So I'm kind of repeating that so that people can hear on the hangout or whatever. But yeah, the more people are challenged, the more they compete, the more they feel like they're growing, the better. So, okay. Uh, unless there's anything else, I'll move on to Taylor Swift and then we'll come back to this in the future. Um, so, how many people have seen this site here? Marissa? Okay. All right. So, what's your name again? Sorry, John. Or, no, yeah, yours. Devin. Devin. I don't know why I forgot. Sorry about that. <laughs> so does that mean that both Marissa and Devin, you have both submitted at this point, or you both got on? And okay, excellent. So, so hopefully one of you are up there. So we see Devin right there. So is that you? Excellent. excellent. Yeah, that's pretty dang good. <laughs> well, so look at that. So before we talk about Marissa real quick, if you don't mind. So. We're talking about the Taylor Swift competition. We're, we're looking at three tenths of a second, basically, right? Of data across eight different songs. Is that right? I don't know. It's it's a variety of songs. And those songs, you're trying to determine whether they're a mega hit or whether they're uh, kind of not as big of a hit. But for Taylor Swift, it's still huge, right? Um, and to be able to do that in such a short time period is really, really not that it's not the easiest thing to do, nor is it something that I think anybody could have expected we would see results this high. So I almost hate that we didn't get to see Devin's submission first and then wait for a while because that is amazing. 97.4648% <laughs> is absolutely incredible, right? Almost always he's predicting that accurately. Have you tried expanding it on to uh, other other data sets or looking at other songs or anything like that? Do you feel like maybe some of your code and your and your features that you chose would be expandable to other spots? Um, yeah, I think the model. I, I didn't do it. Oh, really? Okay. You made it to ninety-seven percent without any feature engineering. Excellent. Well done. <laughs> okay, Marissa, you submitted as well. Are, are you on there as one of the? Which one are you? You're number two. <laughs> Congratulations. Sorry, Devin. <laughs> Very well done. So did you do some feature engineering as well then? Or, or did you? Did you? OK. OK. So does anybody know for sure is this Jed? I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But I'm pretty certain, because this is Jed for sure. And I think this is Jed with um, Scikit. This is our house team at number four. So both of these guys beat our house team. So congratulations. <laughs> that also means that as of this point, unless something else happens with the Google API, as of this point, you guys beat Google. What you were able to accomplish is better than what the Google prediction API could do based off of, of the inputs that we chose. Right. So that's or the Jed chose really. So congrats on that. That's awesome. What's that? That they yeah they can keep submitting and so there's five submissions total that you can do as an individual on this particular site. You could go in and create your own validation sets. You can go in and try to predict against yourself as much as possible to kind of refine it. But uh, you only get five here. These end at midnight on Friday. 
So any tweaking that you can do, anything else, you want to do that now. Okay. Um, so Marissa, <laughs> so that is awesome. So I know you probably don't want to give it away like any key secrets, <laughs> but are there any little things that you wanted to talk about or say, hey, this is what I did or didn't do? I can't repeat all that. Sorry. <laughs> Time and frequency and trying to, yeah, yeah, we'll just call it good. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm just curious how large the base is, how many songs? Yeah, I think it's about eight songs. It might be 10 songs or so total. Uh, but when you're looking at three tenths of a, of a second, it's still fairly decent. When it was compressed down, it was two gigs? Back to the yeah, two gigs. Yeah, yeah. So Devin, while we're while I'm trying to find that because it's not the easiest thing in the world, um, how about you? Are there tips or things that you'd be willing to share as well? So, um, so that her last point, I I also um, took advantage of that. You know, just knowing that it's a sequence that has formed out the not the writing sections. Um, Okay, okay. So deep learning as well, that's pretty cool. Okay. So and you're looking here at um, 300 million views versus 30 million views, right? So I'm seeing on, on YouTube. Okay. So one of the um, so I'm trying to find, and now I don't even remember exactly what the question was that we were looking for. Was it uh, size total? Yeah, two. Uh, so 10. It's a 10 total submissions. Yeah, he doesn't really say it inside there. It yeah. gives you a link to download the data. Okay. Yeah, and I, we might be able to find some of that in that link or one of the other places as well, right? But <clears throat> so. Jed mentioned that for him, uh, in fact, I think I, yeah, so for him, he actually did a lot of feature engineering. So he actually took the, the original Python set that Ben created, and then from there, he started thinking through, okay, what are some of the things that actually make a song more popular or less popular, or what are some of the things that make up a song in general, right? So rather than, and I'm sure he probably looked at time and frequency as well, right? But rather than just looking at time and frequency, he looked at pitch, which is still going to be your frequency, right? The melody and then the beat of that song as well. All of those things are kind of encompassed within time and frequency. But then he focused his feature engineering, everything that he was trying to refine in on, on those particular things. And at this point, he's he's there at the top. Um, now. It's only 1%, so <laughs> I expect one of you two to get up to 99 by tonight, so good luck. <laughs> it's kind of like running a race, right? Trying to get that last 200 of a second is not the easiest thing in the world. But anyway, um, were you guys able to create your own validation sets and then kind of dive in deeper and try to um, look at what, compare one of your sets to another set or back to that original 60% that you provided? of 60% originally, right? Or did you do that after you gave the validation set? Um, so it, I, I combined them and then Yeah, okay. So you, yeah, and the validation you set you have, I believe is just 60% of the data. The 100% set is actually behind the site scoring your your systems and everything right now, So or your uh, data sets right now. So, um, so you don't have the full thing, but it's enough to train on from there. Um, some other things that would be interesting to look at once you get outside of this particular competition is we talked about YouTube views, right? And 300 million versus 30 million. Well, YouTube is a video channel. So rather than just the music, it's also what you're seeing visually as well, right? 
So I think you would then need to dive in a little bit deeper and look at, well, how cute is she looking in that particular video? Or, <laughs> you know, what age groups is she appealing to most? And what do they care about? Is it more about the clothes that she's wearing on a particular day or whatever else? But once you start refining some of that and then expanding out your set and using your model, as, as Devin was talking about, you can start saying, okay, what about all of her songs? And what about her songs plus like somebody sent me an email saying, well, how hard would it be to now throw in Kelly Clarkson and see how they compare, right? Or throw in other people outside of that genre. I think if you can start expanding on that, you could come up with some incredibly valuable things. But even at this point, somebody or several somebodies from this competition could probably take what they've already created and start selling that and start actually taking it out and making it really valuable to people out there, whether they're in this industry or other industries as well, right? Imagine any situation where you might have differences in frequencies and time. I mean, that's, that's pretty large, right? Um, and so now it can become very, very valuable. Let us know, or as a community, talk together and think through those fun different ideas and ways to approach that. Um, we have tonight, tomorrow, Friday, and then every, all of the uh, prizes and everything else will be done on Saturday. But then after that, it's not like your data sets disappear, right? Um, it's not like what you've created just goes up into thin air. Now, Ben mentioned in the email that I was chopping up and forwarding around and everything today that um, there are a lot of companies, a lot of recruiters, as well as uh, big organizations that are looking at this to try to figure out who they should or shouldn't hire. And I can tell you that's absolutely the case. In fact, we've got recruiters here, so. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's right, that's right. So um, these things last a long time. Um, I know a lot of work that has come out of our uh, health equity and skull candy data sets that we did from last year, um, as well as a lot of value that came to those particular companies. Um, the stuff from the air quality competition has turned into projects, has turned into other things that are valuable for people as well, right? Um, and, and the team was able to discover things that has taken years for people in traditional science to, to know and to understand in just a matter of a month, you know, and not even really a full month <laughs> when it comes down to it, right? So it's incredibly powerful. There's a lot of things that can come from this. And yes, we want to motivate you with money and we want to get sponsor dollars and everything else. And if you have people that want to give us money to give to you, please let us know. <laughs> um, you know, the more companies that help us with sponsorship and everything, the better. But find the other ways to be motivated by this for yourself, right? Get excited about it and use it like gamification. You know, if you play a video game or some sort of game on your phone right now, you're probably doing it to get points. Just do it here too, right? And, and get points and see who you can beat and get up there on the leaderboards. Um, in fact, at some point I've, I've thought about, I don't know if the community would want to do it or not. We'd have to make sure it wasn't chintzy or anything, but I'd like to see um, the community have its own kind of ranking system or whatever too, where you can say, okay, look, you know, I'm getting all these points because I've now won three competitions or whatever else, right? So, but you might end up killing each other. So, oh, we know that's terrible. Anyway, okay. Other questions or thoughts or anything else before I kind of wrap up? Yeah. I just have, yeah. I've never been to one of those before. I actually haven't been to Boston in like four minutes. So oh. we're wrapping up right now? Or? Yeah. Yep. Oh, cool. cool. Yep. Yep. Right now. Yeah. So. It's been nice being here. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you, Jim. And sorry we didn't give you time to kind of socialize or anything afterwards. But, you yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out. Make sure to be there at Code Camp. Make sure to be involved in all of these. We will have some cool prizes for this competition. We'll have some cool prizes for the OC Tanner competition as well. Sometimes those are very lucrative. Sometimes those are very uh, entertaining and awesome. But uh, please come out. Let me know if you'd like to help and how you'd like to be involved in all the different things we do. Bart? I just want to point out that you have data dive. Yeah. I've been hitting up eBay for worthless cool. data trivia crap. Yeah. <laughs> that people can win. Yeah, cool. Yes. See? Cool prizes. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you all. Feel free to grab uh, some pizza or something on your way out, too. We got plenty of it. And I don't think Craig wants to take it all home. <laughs> I also have uh, the job data. I do this quarterly data thing. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I got the latest one out, so if anybody's interested, I just bring them the 